Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to your sunset safari of today. We are currently sitting here with a large mixed herd of buffalo who are currently drinking at Galago Pan because it's an extremely hot day today, 30 degrees Celsius and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Now my name is Lauren and on camera I have Seb and it's very hot. I've got my head at this very strange angle because the sun is glaring into my face. So I do apologize about that, but this is exactly why the buffalo are here. And it is fantastic to have the buffalo on Juma again. Now they've been spotted quite a few days in a row and it is just great to see them. It's my first time seeing them again on Juma in quite some time. So of course we're live and interactive. You're welcome to talk to us, ask us questions and leave any comments relevant to what you are seeing. So just send all your questions to the email natgeokids at wildearth.tv. We will do our very, very best to answer them. Now, there's a lot of youngsters here. I'm going to try and see if Seb can show you one of the youngsters. There's one right ahead there. They often tend to stay hidden. They sort of hide amongst mummy. There you go. And you can see tiny, tiny little horns poking out of the top of the head. It's obviously much smaller. And of course, it's a different color. It's a more browny, fawny color, should we say. And I can see, I think, three youngsters at the minute. And I'm going to try and show you the difference between males and females because there's oh. <laughs> something's annoying them. Where are you all going? Okay, so the males have very, very thick, large horns and the horns meet in the middle. And this part is called a boss. Seb's going to give you, a, yeah, there we go. That's a male. So you can see, look how wide those horns are. It covers the whole entire sort of crown of his head. Now, the females don't have this. And this is because the males regularly clash heads with one another. So that is the main difference between males and females. Whereas the female, let's see if we can, there we go. <laughs> has got much thinner and more sort of delicate horns. That horn boss on the top of her head is really not as thick. It doesn't quite meet in the middle as much. Of course, females do not regularly butt heads with one another. So here we've got males, we've got females, and we've got youngsters. So we would, of course, call this a breeding herd. Now, buffalo need water. They are water dependent. So now that it's winter here in South Africa, even though I've just told you it's really hot, it is winter. So of course, it is winter, which means that there's not as many water, like water points around. The buffaloes have to travel to reach the water. Oh, Lorena, I wonder if it hurts growing those horns. I really don't believe it does. So just like as humans, we grow, we go through growth spurts from a baby to a toddler to a small child into an adult. So our bones grow, our whole bodies grow. It will be the exact same for a buffalo. Oh, got an impala coming into the mix. Hello, this is a impala, a female completely alone from what I can see, who is just randomly walking on by the buffalo. Very sweet. Now these animals are not going to fight because they're not competitors. They both might need a drink of water because it is extremely hot. However, they're not going to fight over the food. And that's one of the main reasons that animals do fight in the animal kingdom, food and <laughs> over females. So Impala and Buffalo have absolutely no need to fear one another. They're not a threat to one another. They are, of course, just both herbivores utilizing the same area. So we're going to stay here just a little bit longer because it's so nice to catch up with the Buffalo again, but I am not the only person out today. So we're going to send you across to Jamie. Good 
afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie, and this afternoon, Craig is on camera with me, and a special warm welcome to the Nat Geo kids joining us this afternoon. Look, I have a surprise for you. Ta-da! Rayons. Hello, Rayons. We are back once again with the Styx Pride. Hello, it's all right. Why do you look a little bit nervy? Probably because they are oh, not in their normal territory. <laughs> There's a herd of impala that just came running straight past them and none of them even realized they were there. <laughs> what happened there, guys? That would have been a very nice snack if any of you had realized. So there we go, we found the Styx Pride this morning in this exact position, pretty much in this exact position. So they are still here. We actually had a very exciting morning this morning. Hosanna stealing a kill from a hyena, which was certainly a degree of poetic justice given the number of kills that he's lost. But he certainly gave Pretty a very resounding surprise and a bit of a resounding slap as well, and immediately stole her kill as well as the surprise return of a pride of lions known as the Styx Pride. So remember, get your parents to send through queer questions or any questions that you would like answered, and you can do that on Nat Geo Kids at wildearth.tv. For all the rest of our viewers, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or in the chat section of YouTube. Puma, I know. Puma says that they're so chuffed to see the sticks back in their traditional territory. I know. I mean, as far back as 2010, the sticks pride was spending a lot of time around Juma. And when I first started working here, the, the sort of the central half, right up until quarantine clearings, was belong or belonged at least partially to the sticks pride. And when I very first, the very first lines I ever saw on my interview drive were the Styx lions, the three lionesses, and a tiny, tiny little fluffy cubs who unfortunately didn't make it. That was in June 2015. They unfortunately didn't make it. They didn't survive the Birmingham male takeover. Since then, we've seen them pushed further and further to the south until this year where they've been almost nomadic since the loss of their oldest lioness. So it is really, really nice to see them. I haven't seen them in nearly two and a half years. All of these youngsters are new to me, except perhaps the eldest two. Ah, the sticks versus in Kahuma debate. Melinda says that these lions look bigger in size than the Nkuhumas. Uh, we've spoken, we used to speak about that all the time on drive because we used to see the Inkumas and the sticks quite regularly. The Inkumas, I think, and the sticks are not that different in size, to be completely honest with you. Uh, I actually don't think that the sticks are any bigger. And they are currently not as strong in the sense of if the Inkumas and the sticks were to meet, the sticks would be sent running. And that's just simply because uh, although the pride is 10 members strong, so about the same as the Inkuhumas, they only have two adult females, where the Inkuhumas basically, all four of their sub-adult lionesses now could be considered to be adults, plus the four adult lionesses themselves, plus the two males. They are just by virtue of numbers and ages a little bit stronger. But really, really lovely to see the sticks pride. Ah, Mrs. Lapwing would like to know where I am. Mrs. Lapwing, will you give me one second because I need to, you've reminded me I need to call this in. Our station sticks pride, still same position. Best access is off Twin Dams to the west, just to the south of Wahlberg's Junction and to the north of Jigga Jigga Road Junction. <laughs> That's where I am, in case you're wondering. So we're actually right in the center of the property in the, uh, well, just to the south of the dam cam, largely. So right, sorry, I have to now try and manage this game drive radio, right in the center of what would now be considered to be a Nkuhuma stronghold. Let's just do a head count quickly. 
One, two, three, four, five. There should be ten. I can see six. This morning, I think I counted nine in the end. There's one right at the back over there in the golden light. Gosh, I wish I'd remembered my camera this afternoon, but anyway. So there should be ten, if I'm not mistaken, unless they've lost a member somewhere along the way. All right, we're going to do some shuffling around, maybe spend a little bit longer with the lions, and then we'll leave and come back to them, depending on vehicle pressure. While we do that, let's send you across to Lauren, who is still with her herd of buffalo. So we've stayed with the buffalo because it's just such a such a fantastic sighting. It's just so good to see them. And of course, watching them wallow in the shadows of each other in the little water pan is actually making me feel a little bit cooler. This is the hottest it's felt in quite some time. And I think Seb agrees as well. It is, it is a really, really hot day today. Not that I am complaining because I do love <coughs> the hot, the heat. But I've maybe just got a little bit too many clothes on. This makes it slightly uncomfortable. Now I do wonder where these buffalo are heading because, of course, there's lions around. James is asking, what is the main source of food for buffalo? Well, they are herbivores, so they do eat plant matter. They do eat vegetation, mainly grasses. So they will graze, they are highly mobile, so they will walk from various points and just graze as they go, making their way from water point to water point. But they are obviously huge animals, very, very large animals, with equipped with their own set of very large weapons on their heads. And of course, sticking together in a big group brings a lot of advantages to buffalo because they are the favorite food of the lions. And it does take quite a lot of cooperative effort for lions to take down a buffalo. But of course, there's lots of youngsters in the mix too. So what the herd will do is normally try and keep the youngsters as much inside of the herd as possible to try and protect them from any predators that may try to approach them. And of course, on a day that is as hot like today, it's always worth checking the water points because I'm even thirsty. And of course, the animals will be too in this heat. <laughs> what is that buffalo doing right at the edge here? It's actually bending down on its, mm. I don't know, elbows. <laughs> and you can see it's got an ox beggar on his back, a red belt. That's very sweet. I wonder why he feels the need to do that. Oh. They are lovely, lovely animals. And of course, this is a large herd, but it does sort of reminds me of the days I had up in the Mara with the huge herds of 300 plus, if not more where you literally cannot move your vehicle because you are surrounded by them. It's, it's such a struggle to go anywhere. You literally just have to wait until they sort of move on away from your car before you can actually start to move. Julia's asking, are we far from the six prides? That's actually what Seb and I were both just discussing. We got a bit disorientated. Um, no, in terms of distance, we're really not. Um, they are also on Juma, really, really not that far away. On the other side, but not that far away. So of course it is hot, but it would make it very challenging for lions to hunt in this heat. They tend to hunt during the night, but they have been seen many, many a time hunting during the day as well. So it is possible that if you follow the buffalo, buffalo for long enough, then you might see some lions following them. And normally when we were up in the Mara and we were watching the buffalo, it, the lions would really not be too far away. You would always see the Olololo pride or the Owinos, no, never too far from a large herd of buffalo. The Mara is of course very vast and very open. You can see for miles. Juma's obviously a little, that one's back on its elbows again. I 
wonder why that one actually goes down on its um, little elbows like that. It's very sweet. I've never actually seen that before. So I think QT is asking about the bovine TB that actually passes. Oh, Faith's telling me it again. <laughs> So basically, there was a study that actually said um, in the Kruger Park, it was solely based on the Kruger, um, up to 80% 80, 80 of the lions carry bovine TB, which they call BTB for short. And obviously, it's a very slow progressing disease. Um, but the majority of the lions that carry it, they were obviously tested all the lions, I think it was a blood sample, um, were carriers, but yet they appeared healthy. So they have obviously got this from buffalo, it's from the bovines, but they appeared healthy. It wasn't that as they were seen to be affected by this disease, which led to a lot of questions as to how or why, how do they manage to sort of survive it, if you like. Um, so yes, they can be infected if they do eat infected buffaloes and other animals, of course, it's not just buffaloes. So I believe, I probably would need to check my figures, but I believe it's about 40% of the buffaloes around the Kruger in this study that were tested were actually positive for BTB. So it's very, very interesting, but yes, lions can contract it from infected buffalo, absolutely. This is just so majestic. Most of the herd are actually moving off. It's just sort of the stragglers that are left behind. So talking of lions, of course, Miss Patterson is with the sticks. Over to them. Speaking of lions, our lions are still lying about and potentially have caused a little bit of unrest amongst the Impala and Kudu population to the north of us. But I'm questioning whether or not those Kudu are close enough to have seen these lions. I can just hear the deep call of a Kudu alarm call, which is basically the sound that a Kudu makes when it sees a predator. It's a deep booming bah! sound. And I can hear them, they've stopped now. And the reason that I'm a little bit uncertain that it might be these lions is because this morning while we were searching for these guys and while we were tracking them in this block, there was a leopard calling very, very close to this position. We don't know which leopard it was. I think it was Tingana, but to be honest, we didn't pick up on tracks for him. So we're not 100% sure. It could also be Hosanna coming back towards his favorite spot at the dam. So keep an eye out on the dam camera because there's a very, very prominent game path that goes from here to there. Lauren's mentioned the fact that the buffalo are not far away from where the sticks pride are at the moment. That is... That is definitely a potential hunt situation. However, this pride only has two adult females, so it would be quite a tricky one for them to carry off unless it was a, a young buffalo. But we'll see where the night takes us. Now, of course, this morning took us in an unexpected direction. Many of you questioning whether or not Pretty is okay after her encounter with Hosanna. She is absolutely fine. I think she might have a scratch or two. Um, I don't even feel too sorry for her. Look, she did seem very proud of herself, so I did feel a little bit of pity this morning, but she had eaten a vast amount of that kill already. She, her belly was basically dragging on the ground. And I think it was more the fright more than anything else. Uh, Hosanna capitalized on the element of surprise as he jumped out at her and she dropped her kill in surprise because she wasn't sure what he was or what was going on. I mean, she didn't have time to process anything. And by the time she realized and he grabbed her kill, he was halfway up the tree. And I think the most chance of injury she had was when she bolted at the tree and basically ran straight into it in her attempt to get her kill back. So I think she's fine. I really do. Hyenas are phenomenally tough creatures. One on one, she would definitely beat Hosanna, but that doesn't mean that he wouldn't be capable of doing an immense amount of damage himself. He's a very powerful animal. We tend to forget that because we just, you know, we've watched him grow up and he's our little boy, but he's not our little boy anymore. Uh, 
He's a good 65, 70 kilograms of pure muscle. And he's been honed by his little gap years or gap months in Londolozi. He knows exactly what he's doing. The Sticks Pride, hmm. They have, actually, I think now that I think about it, we've heard of the Sticks killing more leopards than I think any of the other lion prides. That's not necessarily because they have a predilection for killing leopards. It just so happens that they're one of the most prominent and most f most renowned prides in the, the Sabi sand. So that might be why, but I know that they killed uh, Sibuyi's one cub. They killed Tumba's sibling, Tundi's son's sibling. They killed a wild dog with Brent. But still to this day, my favorite ever stick sighting was the, was the little tortoise that wasn't killed. It just crawled under a lion. Megan wants to know how I'm able to tell the prides apart. Look, the makeup of the sticks is, is completely different from the Inkahumas. I was instinctively went with sticks this morning because I looked at how mangy they were. So I haven't seen the sticks in a while, so it was a process of quick elimination. They didn't look like the torchwoods. I've seen photos of the torchwoods. They didn't look like the Talamartis, certainly. And I wouldn't have expected the Talamartis to venture this far south. The sticks have had a reputation for... Hello. Look at that stare. The sticks have had a reputation for getting around the sands at the moment. And they've, they've covered in mange, which was one of the big giveaways. What have you seen? Is this maybe the kudu that was alarm calling? This lion's definitely spotted something. Not staring at us, it's staring back towards us. By the way, I'm sorry about the talking that you can hear. It's just my game drive radio. Typically that's in our ears rather than open for all to hear, but there's a little bit of a problem on this vehicle. And then also just looking at the age of the cubs. I know that the Inkahumas don't have any cubs of under two years old, of which most of these youngsters are, or around two. I don't know what you're looking at. Shri Vant wants to know what the current usual territory is of this pride. It's a really strange one. So the sticks once upon a time were, they're probably the earliest well-known pride of the Sabi sand. They were once upon a time a massive pride and they have used to be quite central to Juma, to the area south of Juma and to Mala Mala. They have since, their territories changed considerably. Uh, when I, as I said, when I first arrived here, they were made their way all the way up to central Juma, but they also went right the way down south towards the Malamana boundary and through Hoffman's, all of those areas. They are now uh, renowned for being all over the show. So we belong to, or some of us belong to a group that basically is a collection of all of the guides in the Sabi sand on um, with all of our phone numbers and it's been astounding just how many messages have gone through this year with various people from various properties across the sand saying my word we've got the sticks here and the sticks there and the sticks all over the show it's been very strange their movements so I'm not sure what their territory actually is anymore it's a little bit confusing, to be honest. Um, I'm just checking to see if I can get the territory maps up, but I'm not allowed to share them with you, unfortunately. But they really... No, it doesn't want to load. It doesn't matter. They, they really have traveled all the way right across to the western edge of the sands, the southwestern corner. Now the go-away birds are calling. Please, please, please keep an eye on the dam cam. I'm probably going to do a quick loop from these lions in a bit because there's definitely something around. I don't think those could were alarm calling at these lions. I'm almost certain of it. There's something else about. Oh, 
there's people coming. I should see the lines. Why it is that the sticks have been as nomadic as they have been is a strange one. I think it's a combination of the male lion territorial movement, particularly with the particularly with the with the Birmingham males moving as far south as they have and no longer patrolling the north, as well as the size of the prides in the area. You know, once prides start to grow, and prides fortunes are kind of like a roller coaster over the years. Sometimes they put pressure on other prides because they're particularly successful. Now, 2T wants to know if these lions will clash with the other prides and the evokers. And the answer to that is if the Inkahumas find them here, yes. The Inkahumas will be thoroughly unimpressed. This is very much now, these days, in Kahuma territory. And they will not be happy to see, <clears throat> to see these lions hanging about in a spot that they consider to be theirs. And if that were to happen, it could be quite risky for most likely the sticks. The evokers, you know, I'm pretty certain that the sticks have encountered the evokers before in the past. And I don't know if they, the females have mated with them. I don't think so. I think it would do the sticks well to avoid the evokers where they can. Some of these cubs are very, are still very much in that danger age where male lions are concerned, where they're just that little bit too young to be safe. So I would say it would, it would be wise for them to avoid the evokers. All right, I mentioned uh, keeping an eye on the dam cam. Lauren's done a quick loop around that area. Let's see whether or not she's picked up on anything that side. I am in the area, I think, but I don't actually know which area. We left the buffalo because, well, they're on their way and I believe there's a cat around. Faith, maybe you could ask Jamie exactly where she thinks it's coming from because we are right next to the dam cam. We took our earpiece out. I don't hear any kudu alarming, which makes me think we could potentially be in the wrong direction. Hosanna's definitely around somewhere, most likely in a drainage because it's so hot and he loves these drainage lines. But if there is alarm calling that we can hear, then it's obviously not from this area. This is why the car is stationary. I do apologize. I just want to make sure I go the right way. There was a leopard sawn this morning that we were just not able to find tracks of, which is just amazing. Near the Wahlberg Junction. Aha! I know exactly where that is. So we're gonna head there, which is actually where we were heading anyway, but we couldn't hear the alarm calls. So I'll need to keep my ears open, if you like, if that's even possible, and see if anyone's around. I don't think I'm gonna venture very far today away from the water points. Once again, without trying to repeat myself, it is really hot and all the animals especially when that sun starts to go down are going to come out for water so i think galago pan and buatella pan are quite close to each other and i think it's a really really good area to keep your eye on especially because of the temperatures of today i still don't hear anything Curtis is asking how hot is it there? Well, it is 30 degrees Celsius, which is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And believe it or not, this is winter. It is winter, definitely a lot better than a Scottish winter. And it is very cold in the morning. If you ever watch our sunrise safaris, we are frozen. We've got gloves and scarves and hats on. So it's very, very cold in the morning and in the evenings, but during the day, the sun pops out. And today is just, it is, is almost, feels like it's summer again, but it's not. Um, but it's extremely hot today for some reason. So this is the road that Jamie thinks the alarm calls are coming from. And from those who are maybe not sure what we're talking about, 
animals, especially some antelope species, their sort of defense mechanism when they see a predator is not to run, it's not to flee, it's almost to fight. They will stand, they will look directly at the predator and they will bark, they will give this big Ugh! which means I've seen you. You can't come to me now, your, your game's up, I've seen you. And everyone else in the herd, all the other impalas, all the other kudus, all the other inyalas have seen you. So game is over. And it works quite effectively when they see the predator, normally the predator will give up. So when these animals make this sound, you can hear it, and it generally means something's within the vicinity. They don't do it for vehicles or other antelope or buffalo. They do it for predators. Hmm. Hosanna's well, definitely not around quarantine, so that was an amazing sight in the Jamie had this morning, but he's disappeared. Ashley's asking about meerkats. Unfortunately, we don't have meerkats here. They're not found in this area. They are found in lots of different other areas across Africa, but unfortunately not here, which is a shame because meerkats are so lovely. But we do have sort of, well, similar-ish looking animals and their behavior in the mongoose. I'll try and show you some, some mongoose. Normally we see the dwarf species and they sort of also go up on their hind legs, which is slightly similar, but we don't get the meerkat, meerkats here, unfortunately. Hmm. I think it's, uh, my gut's telling me it's Hosanna that they alar they'll be alarming it. Because this is, this is quarantine now, our favorite area quarantine. And this is exactly where he was this morning. So he's probably slept out. There you go, Seb's gonna give you a beautiful view of this clearing. He's probably slept the whole day to avoid the heat. And he could be on the move. Alrighty. Decision time. We're probably gonna go down here and see if we can get any signs of anybody alarming. But of course, once these animals do alarm and they do bark, the predator normally does walk off. Alrighty, it looks like I'm not the only one bumbling now. We are gonna send you back to Jamie who's doing exactly the same. I've just moved away from the lions for now to allow other vehicles to go in and have a look at them. We'll be back a bit later, uh, as soon as it gets time for them to start moving. What I'm going to do now is just have a quick look around, a little scratch around for Hosanna. I've got to where the kudu were alarm calling from. Uh, there's a chance that he's walking back from where he was towards water. Of course, it also depends upon his hunting successes as well. So this morning when we were with him, before he decided to fly it pretty and steal her kill, he was actually quite hungry and he was hunting unsuccessfully, very unsuccessfully actually. He was spotted almost immediately, but he, he was hunting and he is hungry. So he might have continued to do that throughout the day. In winter, in summer even, leopards can be very unpredictable. They quite happily hunt at very strange times even in 40 degree weather and it's been nice and temperate today so there's a chance that he moved quite far in search of food i'm just going to go check one of his favorite hangout spots off rebecca's road hey, Jamie, for lauren. oh hello lauren's trying to chat to me standing by which woods are you planning on checking all right, I'm gonna go down Philemon's dip and towards Rebecca's if you wanna check Western Edge of Quarantine. Copy, copy. There's nothing coming out on Wahlberg's that I can see. Sorry, guys. Yeah, we just checked Wahlberg's and nothing. Said things the alarm calls were coming from the other side of the train edge, so I might check Central. Okay, copy. They weren't. Um, I did see the kudu before I went into the lion sighting, but they might have moved. Yeah, 
is, of course, entirely possible that the Kuru were alarm pulling at the lines. I just don't think they could see them. Okay, let's do a quick nip round here. He hasn't walked on top. Unfortunately, there's lots of vehicles moving around. So there's also the potential for tracks being driven over. Kathy, <laughs> sorry. <coughs> oh, there's Lauren. I was trying to say Kathy. Um, <laughs> Kathy would like to know where the black leopards in, are found in Africa. <laughs> it was hilarious. There's one actually that's been recorded, supposedly, not far from where we are now, on a place called Leidenberg, or Mashisheng, as it's now known, which is towards um i forgot what i was doing i was giving faith a thumbs up what am i doing how's it going sorry kathy hold that thought okay so we're gonna go run this way cool and you're gonna take run this yeah way. i'm just gonna take his little two track that runs along that drainage and maybe we get lucky there okay cool, cool. Good luck. enjoy Good luck. thank you <laughs> Right, black leopards, yeah. So what you'll find is black leopards are basically melanistic leopards. It's a genetic thing, it's a recessive gene. What you'll find is that, as you would predict, the gene is selected for in places where black is more uh, selected for. So that typically means more forested areas. That's why you find more black leopards in, say, India, for example, or most likely in the central forests of Africa. Unfortunately, those tend to also be areas most associated with a huge degree of human conflict. So I would say that there's probably more black leopards in those areas than we think. Black leopards have been seen pretty much all over Africa. At the moment, there's some in Kenya, or at least one that's been quite prominently seen in Kenya. But it's, in, you know, it's possible for that gene to suddenly reveal itself anywhere, including Juma, just in the same way as happened with the white lions at Ngala, which is close to Open Gate. But you'll find generally there's a slight skew in favor of more black leopards being found in more forested areas. I'm, there's tracks, oh, there's a hyenas. Mm. That, that black leopard in Leidenberg, I'm, I'm not certain if it isn't an urban legend, although I've had many people swear to me that they've seen it. So I guess it's possible. Maybe there's camera trap photos. I'm about to, I'm, I imagine I'm about to get an angry message from someone in Leidenberg saying, but it's true. Or Mashishing. So it's possible. I've never seen a black leopard. I would obviously love to there's something that people find and i've noticed it particularly since i've started working with safari live is color aberrations get people talking no ashley i haven't seen tumba recently he unlike hosanna didn't just go on a a little sojourn into the southwestern corner of the sabi sands he went for good and it appears he's moved in quite contentedly towards Singita's side. So no, I haven't seen Tumba recently. I did see the pictures of him with half an ear missing. Such is life. Shame. And he had such gorgeous, big, beautiful ears. But he has lost half of one. It makes him look very cool, I guess, in a sort of a macho, bad boy kind of way. Never thought I'd ever say that about Tumba. There was something so innocent about his oversized ears and bottle green eyes. But now he's got a bad boy look to him. And he'd be absolutely fine without the top half of his ear. It probably was very painful, but he'll be fine. All right, bear with me. I'm going to concentrate quite hard at looking for Hosanna. Lauren is focusing quite hard at looking for Hosanna as well as perhaps examining the trees he might be under. Yes, we are looking at the Marula. He was actually up this morning during that epic sighting. This is the one. He obviously raced up it after stealing poor Pretty's 
breakfast, I guess. And there's absolutely nothing, nothing that I can see remains of any sort of kill or carcass or anything, to be honest. Seb and I have been looking for a few minutes now and we really don't see a thing. So we're at the sort of very bottom of quarantine, if you like, and there's a drainage line right here. So it goes right down into a drainage and my gut's telling me that Hosanna is in there somewhere. There's no easy way for us to drive in and have a look, but I think he probably would have went down there. So it's worth just sort of scratching around, see what else we see. We're going to keep doing loops. We'll keep checking in on a buffalo as well. Sometimes you end up venturing too far and you miss everything. So we're just going to keep our venturing very tight today because we do know the animals are around. It's just a case of finding them. Now the sun is right in my eyes right now, but once it gets a little bit lower, that is when your animals really do start to wake up and go for a drink. So that's what we're banking on. As many of you know, I have said quite openly, I give up on the hyenas. They were all far too busy this morning, running around being hyenas to even think about being near the sort of communal den stroke hangout area. I didn't quite get the name Faith or repeat it, but the question is rather hilarious. Uh, <laughs> do Timon and Pumba live on the reserve? Happy feet, I thought I thought you said that happy feet. Um well Pumba does, I guess. Pumba definitely lives on the reserve. Uh, Timon sadly not. Timon is obviously a meerkat and we don't get them here, but we do get warthogs, so I guess, yeah. Pumba does live on the reserve and oh the Lion King movie is due to come out soon one of Jamie's favorite topics and I can imagine we will all have a movie night here with copious amounts of popcorn salty that is anyone that likes any other kind of popcorn I just cannot understand that cannot be their friend and I imagine we will have a movie night obviously there's a lot of inaccuracies in the movie of course but same with Finding Nemo it's targeted for a younger audience and it's not necessarily a biologically accurate movie but it is fantastic all the same I, Lion King and The Little Mermaid were my childhood so yes we got Pumbas but we ain't got any Timons <laughs> but thank you for that question Happy Feet I really appreciate it and we're driving right into the sun, which is not ideal right now, but this is actually the drainage, believe it or not, that I found Posano when he first came back after his second little breakaway to Londolozi. So he is known to stay in here quite a bit. So of course, as you all know, Jamie is also bumbling. We're both on a mission, girl power. So we're gonna send you across to her for an update. I just jumped out and went for a quick walk rather than bumbling. Just because I heard some Franklin alarm calling. But unfortunately, Franklin I've seen get a fright at their own shadow and immediately start shrieking in terror. So they're not particularly reliable, um, reliable lookouts. They often alarm call for the strangest things. Uh, I couldn't see anything. I went for a quick, quick walk in the drainage line. Nothing there. This is his, no, it's not. Where am I? Not yet, soon, but not yet. He's got, there's a little two track that is there, courtesy of Hosanna and Shongile. And by, what I mean by two-track is an area where vehicles have moved in so often off the road that there is a place where they, they've they made a track, essentially. I'm just going to follow that quickly to where he was most likely to have gone. It's directly opposite where he was this morning. Ah, the magic dragon wizard. You see, I told you, people have... It gets people talking. The topic of strange coloration. Magic dragon wizard wants to know what would make a leopard black as opposed to normal colored. And the answer to that is melanin. 
So any kind of excess melanin, it's a type of pigment that is expressed at courtesy. So you know how genetics works, how genes work. Gene basic, genes basically determine what an animal looks like and your phenotype. And that can be your eye color, can be your hair color, it can be all sorts of things, whether you're prone to freckles or whatever the case may be. And in the case of black leopards, it is a recessive gene. And what recessive means is that it has to be, if there is any other gene for any other coloration, then the black leopard gene will not be expressed. So that means that you have to have two animals with that recessive, either carrying that recessive gene or um, you must have two recessive individuals, two melanistic individuals that mate and then produce these offspring. It's rare. It is a rare, rare thing. Recessive is generally recessive for a reason. Like with white lions, white generally or pale is not necessarily a color that is particularly useful in the bush. He loves this termite mound, but he isn't loving it today. So that's what makes black leopards black. They do still have some spots underneath. If you look really careful, carefully at pictures of black leopards, you will see that the, you can actually, their spots are just a little bit visible. Same goes for jaguars, black jaguars. <coughs> you can also see the spots there. So those, the spottiness is still, the gene still runs strong even if it's not as clearly expressed. He shot up into that tree over there. Where's the bush by sight? That's there, so he went up into, is it that tree? I think it was that tree. Ah. Umkar wants to know how soon we will get results from the DNA sample that I picked up of Hosanna. We might not, to be completely honest with you, Umkar. Um, as you know before, we did collect Hosanna's scat. Sometimes samples just don't work out the way that they need to in order to be tested for DNA. Hopefully that isn't the case with this one, but it could be. Mm, but it will take some time. It takes time for the DNA to be tested. It also, uh, you know, scientists don't necessarily release their results immediately to public. They may never result, release the results necessarily for complete public consumption, although we will definitely find out who Hassan's father is. If, we, if that sample is successful, if they get other samples as well, it would be really interesting to know, wouldn't it? I'm pretty certain it's Tingana, but you can never be 100% sure. Now I'm just a bit directionless. I'm gonna go back. Go back to the road. I should've just gone back to where he was and looked for his tracks. Sorry, Craig. Oh, the number of times Herbie and I have walked Hosanna in this block. Mm. They will release the results again, but it's a matter of time and obviously they can't be rushed. It, it's a very, very comprehensive project. It's a very important project and the work that they're doing is extremely valuable. Certainly fascinating. Okie dokie, no luck here. I think the best bet is to walk into that drainage line where he was. All right, I'm gonna do a quick loop. Lauren is also looping this area. I did promise her I'd help her while I wait for all the vehicles to see the lines. So while we search this end, she's searching the other side. Looping to looping, we are also looping. Almost got tongue tied there. Didn't prove fruitful, but the buffalo were here. This is where we found them. So we may just check up on their movements. And this is where we heard the sawing this morning. And I know I've mentioned it already, but it was really frustrating me because I felt like it was Tingana. And where can he be? Why did we not see any of his tracks? Oh, 
If only Tangana knew how much I loved them. So yeah, I feel like there's a lot of activity in this area and it just is getting to that perfect time of day. So we are going to continue looping. You don't get until you try, I'm afraid. So we're going to go down a very, oh, should we go back to the pan? Pan or fire break, pan or fire break. Possibly pan. If the buffalo have moved off, there's probably other animals that have came in for a drink. Hi, buffalo. Janet's asking about the male coalitions of lions and is there any other coalitions other... Sorry, that bird is not happy. Oh, the buffalo are still here. We have a buffalo crossing. I'm just going to drive slowly. You don't want to upset a buffalo. Hello. You guys didn't go very far. Just want to give it some distance. Male buffaloes are known to be a tad on the grumpy side. Uh, male coalitions, that's correct. So it is the, the, the Avocas are the main male coalition around here now. They've came and it looks like they are here to stay. They're obviously meeting with the Uncahumas and they have really sort of made their territory and it's a large one. Now, obviously the Birmingham boys were here before, but they have sort of up sticks <laughs> and left and they are found much further south now. So yes, Janet, the Avocas are the main dominant male coalition around here now. But their territory, as I mentioned, mentioned is so large they're not always found on Juma and of course there's three of them three magnificent males and their territory will most likely hold or sort of overlap with different female pride territories that's how it works with lions because they do mate with different prides and just to give you sort of an example of what I'm talking about while we watch this buffalo the dispute in the Mara with the Olololos and the River Prides, which was a really, really difficult thing to watch and witness. And, you know, we all were all a little bit shocked by that, shall we say. The Kichwa males were present and they are also very dominant, strong males out in the Mara. And they did nothing. They, they, they growled and they snarled, but they didn't get involved. And most likely, as crazy as it sounds, they are actually mating with both Prides or maybe not simultaneously but they have mated with both prides and their territory includes both prides which is most likely why they did really not enter into that dispute at all they sort of stayed on the sidelines and it really was the females that were disputing it out i was kind of hoping this buffalo would cross the road this is a female buffalo i think so that I can actually drive past. There we go. Wonderful. So it looks like they really haven't left the pan at all. I thought they would have traveled off a little bit further than that, but we are gonna go very slowly past them. And I'm gonna try the other side of the drainage line to see if there was potentially any alarm calls coming from there. Wow, you can smell them. Look at this one with the grass hanging out of his mouth. Can you see that, Seb? Oh, they've all got grass hanging out of their mouth. So we did have a question earlier about what they eat, and there you go. <laughs> Not so elegantly either. They are bulk grazers, grazing on all the grass here. And of course, the grass is very dry, but that is their main source of food here. Oof, I can smell you guys. Mm hmm Sorry. So we're going to continue on forward and let the buffalo be, I think. We're going to encounter a lot more of them along the roads. Because they're surrounding us. I really thought they would have moved a little bit further on from the pan by now, but they haven't. I just know that someone's going to come and drink. And of course it's rehearsal tonight, which means all the animals will be out. Michael's asking, can buffalo interbreed with cows? No, they cannot. Oh, okay, we've got a major roadblock here now. 
definitely, definitely not going anywhere for a while. No, Michael, they cannot breed with cows. And all along the road from here to Votella Dam, you can see they are, they're their dung, if you like. It's absolutely everywhere. So the buffaloes have obviously been traveling all day. And of course, leaving evidence of themselves behind. Now, I'm sure if I, if I did drive right up to them, they would actually move off the roads. However, I don't want to, to scare them or upset them in any way. Now, they are actually said to drink up to 35 litres of water at a time in mere minutes. 35 litres, can you imagine that? So they are heavily water dependent. They'll take in a large volume of water at a time. So they don't need to sort of drink all throughout the day, but they do need regular access to it. 35 litres is just absolutely incredible. I'm very, very happy these buffalo are around. You can hear them crunching. Rob is asking a very good question. Will a buffalo charge a vehicle? And ultimately, I guess it is possible. Yes, it has been known. Uh, mainly by the males, the older males that we called Daga boys and Daga is basically a Zulu word for mud. So it's the sort of older males that are normally said to be past their reproductive peak, around 10 years old on average. And they're normally sore, they're normally a lot older, and they spend a lot of time wallowing in the mud. And this is probably to soothe their skin and their wounds and sort of itch off all those parasites. And that's where the name Daga Boys actually comes from. Now, you can normally tell a Daga Boy, and these are the ones that are said to be very, very aggressive. They're probably older and they've just got a bit of a temperament. So they are said to charge vehicles and it has happened. There is lots of evidence of it without reason, if that makes sense. You know, they're just said to approach a vehicle and just get very, very angry. So you do have to be careful. But with a herd like this, it's a mixed herd. We're keeping our distance. I'm not driving my car. Um, there's males and females. There's young. Don't, there's not any imminent threat at the moment to us. But yes, the older buffalo have been said to be a little bit grumpy, shall we say, in charge vehicles. So you do have to be very, very careful of them, of course. And there's quite a strict hierarchy within the herd. It may not look it like it right now, but there's a dominance hierarchy within the males and the all, all the males in the whole herd are much superior to the females. So the males come first if you like and then within the males there will be a dominance hierarchy between them so due to their nature of moving to find water because obviously i've mentioned that they're water dependent it means they're not territorial they move and go with the flow from resource point to resource point so they really are in territorial Maxwell's asking why are the buffalo not eating the green stuff, I think? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. The green stuff first. Yeah, so they're actually just eating the grass. So we've got trees and shrubs and leaves and bushes, but they're actually specifically feeding on the grass that's on the ground. That's what they want. They are bulk grazers, which means they're not really fussy, but they do feed mainly on the grasses. And right now, most of the grass here, unfortunately, is very, very dry. So it doesn't look very green, but that is indeed what they are eating at the moment. <laughs> It is just so wonderful to see them again. And the sun's really starting to go down behind us now, which is casting this sort of golden glow over all the buffalo here. It's just gorgeous. So we just want to say a big thank you to everyone for joining this Nat Geo Kids Drive. It has been fantastic spending time with the buffalo. Please do join us again. And until then, we'll see you later.